Again, please join me in welcoming my dear friend and great presenter, Dana Moore. Thank you, Alens. Okay, have to make sure I have the clicker, right? So, one thing I like to do when I present is I like to give books away. I am a book fanatic. I love business books. I love a lens book. I've already given 50 plus of those away. So today you're not going to get a lens's book, but you can, you can buy it if you haven't done so. Um, so what I'd like to do, I've got three different books, so I'm going to give six away. Built to Sell, Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workplace, The Vibrant Workplace. So I'll just set those here. But I'd just like you to put your business card or you can put your name and your email on, an, on one of these papers, fold it and put it in. We're going to draw six. And I will, I'm here today and tomorrow. So I will email you, let you know if you get the book and we'll get it over to you. If you don't want to do that, you can uh, text. I just realized last week, I don't have business cards anymore. So I would doubt that you guys do either. So you can certainly send me a text of your name and, and email and I'll, we'll draw names somehow. We'll figure it out. Oh, oh, so one of you will get the basket. So I, I am, uh, <laughs> thank you, Lens. So I uh, serve on a nonprofit board for this awesome organization called Guatemalan Humanitarian uh, Services. And we, um, trips actually, we take trips to Guatemala. She does, uh, so I took my daughter, my seventh, no, she was 16 at the time to Guatemala, I'd never been to a third world country, and it was amazing, and it was amazing for the teenagers that went with us. So this is, we now have a preschool down there. The moms of the kids that come to our preschool made these baskets by hand. Toby and I, the director, bought a couple when we were there, and we love them. So I do have a bunch of these, but one, one of you will get that as well. So if you'll just pass that down. Okay, let's get started. So I love a lens. When he asked me to do stuff, he um, kind of adds his, his, own, his own flavor. I, he added the human factor. That's not me. And the more I thought about it, I love it. Because the human factor, just what we've talked about, if you were there last night, so far today, the human factor actually is what messes things up or keeps you out of trouble. So we're gonna dive into the human factor in the legal side of your business. And my daughter, 12 year old, a couple days ago said, you have to talk for 50 minutes? She knows how boring I am. So I apologize up front, but I, we've tried to spice this up a little bit. But I could talk all day long about this. And so as an attorney, I have to give you my disclaimer. You know, I'm not giving you particular legal advice. This is general information. If you want to come talk to me, I'm so happy to talk to you. Again, I'm around today, tomorrow. As I am going through stuff, I can guarantee you there's going to be something that you're like, oh, I have a question. Come and ask me. I'm so happy to help you out. OK, so we've got a few things to cover. We are going to cover how the human factor affects the American dream, reality, because it is time for all of you to face reality. Uh, we're going to see how it affects us as business owners, clients, customers, employees, and independent contractors. There's more I could cover, but these are the top ones that I deal with on a daily basis. OK, my dad, he is the perfect example of the American dream. He was from Sweden and had an eighth grade education. He came to the States at the age of 20. This is him leaving to get on the boat to come over here. And he, uh, whoops, he uh, had a ton of sales jobs when he first came to the States. Decided, oh, I'll be a brick mason. Went to Chicago, became a brick mason. Did that for a number of years, moved the family to Utah, started his own bricklaying company, did that for a number of years. I'm now five and a half years old. He hurts his back. What does a typical entrepreneur do? He sells that business and says, oh, let's open a furniture store. Let's go from bricklaying to furniture. Has nothing to do with the other. But you know what? If you're an entrepreneur, you've got the motivation. You see that you can do anything you want. So he does. He opens up a furniture store. And if you're from Salt Lake, maybe you know my family store. I grew up here. 
And as typical entrepreneur, he's wearing all the hats. He's, he's delivering the furniture. He's selling the furniture. He's assembling the furniture. He's dealing with employees. He's paying the bills. He's collecting the money. He's um, making sure that everything is running smoothly. And if there's no cash flow, he's going down to the bank to talk to his personal banker to make sure that there's enough credit line available to cover the shipment he's got to bring in. The tank, you know, back then we had container ships of furniture coming from Denmark. And so he had to have enough funds in there to cover that. So I grew up in a family business. Some of you might have also. It's not as um, ideal a lot of times. It looks like it is. The employees think that you're special and you've got all the money in the world. They don't see the the behind the scenes, the stress of being the business owner, the stress of being the daughter of the business owner or the son-in-law of the business owner. This is all of us, my brother-in-law, my brother, and my dad and me. Um, but like Alain said this morning, small business, man, it's so important. You have to take care of it. We've talked about health. So now we're gonna move on to the health business. We need you to survive. We need you to be thinking about these things because you provide the economy. You support our economy. All right, we're going to do a little reality check. This is my, um, my paralegal's husband. I made him do a photo shoot with me one day, and he has great facial expressions. So if you get on our website, you'll see his name's Jason. You'll see him there a lot. We're going to go through a little bit of a reality check. So... So I want you to imagine that you're the business owner in this situation. You have probably either, like we've already talked about, come from a family business, you've inherited the family business, you're stepping into those shoes, now it's up to you to run it. Or maybe you're the business owner that uh, always knew that you were going to be a business owner. And so you went to school, got the education you needed, started the business. Or maybe, this is more typical that I see today, is that you're the business owner that um, actually got an education, went to school, start working at your what you thought was your dream job, and then ideas start forming, and you start a side gig. And then that side gig, you're working nights, but then all of a sudden that side gig takes over, and now it's your full-time gig. And so in that process, as a business owner, we, we put in a lot of time and emotions into our businesses. We've got our dreams locked up into them, but we also put in some money. Sometimes we have the money, sometimes we have to go get a business loan. But today I see a lot, business owners are using all sorts of credit cards, like a, variety amount, right? Just to cover whatever cash flow needs are happening at the time. So there's stress. So now you start your business, you're in maybe two or three years. Maybe now you're starting to hire employees. Maybe you are going to lease an actual space. So you've got to sign that commercial lease agreement, which means you're signing over personally to guarantee that you will cover the lease if your business can't. Now, maybe you're buying equipment or products to sell, like the, the furniture that's coming over from Denmark. Now there's more at stake. So now what's gonna happen? What if you get a phone call or an email? I guess you could still get a fax. I don't know, I don't get faxes anymore, but maybe um, a demand letter that comes from an attorney or an email from a customer or a phone call or a voicemail message or a text that is coming from an employee or, uh, um, sorry, or, and it says, we're gonna take legal action against you for something that you did or something maybe you didn't do or something that one of your employees did or one of your employees failed to do but should have. So then what happens? So now you're that business owner that I heard somebody say today, we're putting out fires throughout the day. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're trying to get through the day because now you've got all this stuff going on and you are the go-to person as the owner and you are putting out those fires. And 
that phone call, that email, that text, it can be devastating because now you've got your employees' families who are relying on you. The stakes are much higher. It's not just your family anymore. It's their families who need that income. It's the continuity of your business that's at stake. So what are you going to do? It can be devastating and shocking. You probably might need therapy. <laughs> but as the business owner, I keep telling people, you are the ones in control of your business. And that is the reality. So my goal today is I want you to be able to say when you are in that situation, because you will be. And I was thinking this morning, it's kind of like the Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program. The first step is to admit you have a problem. As a business owner, the first thing you need to admit is you will have a legal situation. You will. Not what if I will. You will. There will be something. It may not go all the way to court, but even that beginning, a demand letter can cause a ripple effect. You will have something. If you're lucky, it will only be once in the life of your business. Usually it's a little bit more because you're risking more than that. All right, so as the business owner, the buck does stop with you. You're it. You are the one in control. You are the one that makes the decisions. So how can you say, and this is my goal for you today, I want you to be able to say, you know what, bring it on. You want to sue me? Bring it on. Can you say that? I, I, learned that, I learned that from actually a CPA. If I have all of my financials in order, I can say to the IRS, bring it on. Come audit, Come audit me. I don't care. Bring it on. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. So now I am applying that to running your business. I want all of you to be able to say, you know what, bring it on. Because I have done. I'm in control. I've made decisions. I'm going to be OK if you want to take legal action against me. Because I know I've done what I've needed to do to limit the amount of harm that you can actually do to my company. All right. You know, I, as a mom, I've got three kids. I would love to be able to control my children. Do any of you feel that way? You know, can we just be, can they be puppets? And we just say, no, you're not going to make that choice. You're going to go this way. I would love that. Unfortunately, facing reality, we can't control our kids, let alone anybody that works for us. We cannot control them. We cannot control our clients, our customers, patients, whatever it is that you're dealing with. You can't control independent contractors. You can't control your suppliers. All you can control is yourself. And so how you decide to run your business is really on you. All right, the reality is that business owners, you find yourself in legal action over two main things. 30% of the average lawsuits that, it, that are filed, so these are actual cases filed as claims are due to breach of contract. So a simple misunderstanding can turn into a nightmare. So we're not even talking about issues that don't actually start, but then they could turn into an actual lawsuit, but they don't. We're not talking about those. So this is just facts of actual lawsuits against um, small business owners. And when I say small business owners, I am talking about under 50 employees today. That's my definition today when we're talking statistics. Oh, sorry. So 40% 40% have to do with employee stuff. So sexual harassment, discrimination, the fun stuff, right? So I forgot to tell you. When I first started out, I went to law school. I knew after working for my family's business for since I was um, probably 12 years old. Um, I knew I wanted to do um, plaintiff's employment law. I wanted to be a civil rights attorney, and I wanted to get rid of discrimination all on my own. That's what I thought I could have happen. Obviously, that doesn't work, right? You can't do it on your own. But I, after graduating from the U, I went to Boston and worked for a nonprofit for two years in HR. Because I felt like if I really wanted to pursue employment law, I needed some experience, and that gave me a leg up. And I still was gung-ho 
representing employees. So I actually sued business owners like you for many years. And I don't do it anymore, <laughs> as Elance was saying. It is devastating to see the heartache on both sides for the employee and the business owner. How much money is wasted, how much time is wasted, how much emotional investment it takes to go through a lawsuit is crappy, you guys. And I just don't want you to have to even go through it. And I saw that there are just simple things that you can do on a daily basis to try and avoid landing into an actual lawsuit. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So the rest, the th remaining 30% that you find yourself in, it's gonna be over the basics that I don't handle, the tort. Somebody came into your restaurants, they fell and they hurt themselves. It's that kind of stuff. All right, so as a book business owner, we have choices. Uh, your choice is to uh, roll the dice and risk it all. And I do have clients who are willing to do that. And the risk isn't just the money of battling a lawsuit. The risk is also, will the business survive? Will I survive? Can I still afford to pay my employees? There's more at stake. So you're not just rolling dice, you're rolling your whole business and everything that goes along with it. And there are some people that are willing to do that. They don't see the need to spend the money today to take a few precautions so that it doesn't cost the business to go under later. Well, with choices, it's important to know that as the business owner, I want to remind you, and when you leave today, I want you to keep telling yourself this, and I love that I'm going to identify as healthy. You know, in today's world where we're all self-identifying, that's going to be mine. I identify as healthy when I'm asked. Um, I love that. But one other thing I want you to remember is that you guys are in control of your business. Your employees don't run your business, you do. I, I just think that sometimes we get so inundated with the daily fires and all of the stress, you're under a lot to be compliant. But at the end of the day, it's your choice if you want to roll the dice or not. So you have to balance the risk and you're gonna have lots of decisions to make if you haven't already, where you are balancing the risk. My job as the attorney is to put it all out there for you. Say, these are, these are your options, but at the end of the day, it's your decision. Is it going to be worth the risk or not? And sometimes it isn't, even me. Sometimes I'm like, you know what? Look, looking at everything, it's not worth it to me to actually go through and spend the money to put that contract in place right now when I don't have money. Maybe that's gonna work a year from now when there's more cash flow. Or you, you've gotta make those decisions, but just keep in mind, I, I'm reminding clients all the time because they get really inundated with some key employees that are putting pressure on them to do certain things. It's not that employee's decision, it's yours. If you own your own business, you are the one that needs to make the decision. All right, I do want to, before we get into um, the specifics, I just want to give you some actual numbers. So, how much does a misunderstanding cost in reality? On average, it will cost a small business, again, under 50 employees, between 3,000 to 150,000 on average. So, do you have that, you know, 3,000 seems reasonable, right? but that's the bring it on stage. You've done everything, it's gonna be easy to get that misunderstanding to go away. You're gonna to have to pay out some, but it's not gonna be as much as you would if you didn't have everything set up right. But even 150,000, who has 150K just lying, sitting in the bank? Not, not many small business owners, I can tell you that. This lawsuit will take two to three years. So if you're, the, if you're just growing a business, do you have time to step away to go do depositions, to get together all the documents that you're gonna have to produce? This is the hassle of a lawsuit. It is the biggest pain in your side that you will ever go through, and it's emotional. And we'll talk a little bit about how it can really affect your business. All right, so that's what you need to decide. Is it really worth the risk? So in Utah last year, the UALD, the Utah Anti-Discrimination Labor Division, awarded $1 million to employees 
from small businesses with less than 50. Uh, there was a drywall company that had to pay 650 in back wages. So discrimination cases are a whole different story because we go before juries. Those are kind of fun for the attorneys, right? Because it's, it's, a, it's a gamble. And I do like, it was exciting to win a motion, especially against an older attorney who thought that I didn't know what I was doing. Those are fun and exhilarating, but not for the clients. Not on their end, because they're risking a lot. Juries are so unpredictable that you just don't know. So there was a case, and this is what happens with discrimination claims. Under Title VII, even if the plaintiff is awarded just $1, then the plaintiff's attorney can then go after the defendant. So the company, you, would have to pay the plaintiff's attorney's fees because the jury awarded $1. So we're not talking a million dollars. Just $1 triggers where you would have to pay fees for not only your attorney, but the plaintiff's attorney. OK, so that's the reality. All right, we're on legal entities. Who has a legal entity? Awesome. Think about why. Why did you get that legal entity? Separation. What? Separation. Separation from what? Personal finances. Personal finances, OK. Personal liability. Who told you to get the legal entity? I'm, I'm picking on Lark. I'm sorry. She's an easy target. I, I just knew that that was probably the smart thing to do. Okay. I mean, I'm asset based, so. Yep. Okay. Anybody? I saw hands over here. Well, I did. I did mine for tax reasons and um, and put, being put in a different tax bracket. Okay. So for tax reasons. For taxes. That's a great reason. Anybody else want to answer? So yeah, I'm I'm a health person. I'm not a business person. <laughs> <laughs> and so my coach told me to my my business coach. <laughs> Your said, business you need to be said, a, a, okay. a legal entity, and I'm like, I don't know what that means. Okay. <laughs> so, learning as I'm going. You know, I, I spoke with, um, I spoke with professionals who, you know, coached me into the right one to get, and it's paid off. Yeah. So we paid the money, and I'm set up right. You know. Yep, that's great. So you, you were coached, business coaches advice to get a legal entity in which particular one? Yes. It kind of separates the li your liabilities from your fees. It does separate liabilities for sure. Okay, so I tell clients every single day there are two reasons to get a legal entity. One is for tax purposes and one is for liability protection. So if you are sued, do you deserve I want that you don't have to answer out loud, but I want you to think through this question as I'm talking through legal entities. Will you deserve liability protection from the court with your legal entity? With a legal entity, we have different options. So is a DBA a legal entity? No, no thank you. I, for some reason, that is such a mistake that people have that they can just have a DBA filed with the state and they have a legal entity. It is not. That is just being a sole proprietor. So a legal entity, we're only going to talk about two today, S-Corps and LLCs. An LLC is definitely the most common. And I'm not going to get into the tax reasons. Barbara is for that tomorrow. She will do that. I am only focusing on the liability protection. So I have a lot of clients who think that um, They've got their LLC registered, they did it, and, and really you can. You can do it online. You can do it yourself with the state. Uh, you can hire us attorneys to do it. Your CPA can do it. The, the biggest mistake I find, though, is that they get it done, however that happens, and they don't understand that there's maintenance involved. And maintenance is what allows you to prove to the court that you actually deserve liability protection. So it's not enough just to get it registered. We have to have maintenance. So what in the world is maintenance? So a single member LLC, maintenance means documentation, 
It also means, and that's mainly where I'm gonna focus, but there's a whole list. I have a list of like 20 things. It's filing taxes, paying your taxes, keeping your books accurate. It's keeping your registration with the state active, not letting it be dissolved without your knowledge. It's, um, it, there's a whole list of things that are simple. It's having that business permit with the city that your headquarters is located in. I'm going to focus on the documentation side because that's really the part that a lot of you aren't or haven't actually explored. So documentation means with an LLC, an operating agreement and consent forms. For an S Corp, it means bylaws and a shareholders agreement and consent forms and meeting minutes and the notice of meeting minutes. So an S Corp's maintenance on the complication scale is a little bit higher than an LLC. LLCs are definitely the easiest legal entity to get set up, and it's the easiest one. If it's a single member, one owner, it's the easiest one to maintain. So if you want to take it easy, just start with a single member LLC. If you want to take your company public, don't start with an LLC. Just keep that in mind. So does a single member, if there's one owner, it seems a little weird that I am saying you need an operating agreement. That's the biggest mistake. So the purpose of an, of an operating agreement for a single owner LLC versus a multi-member LLC is a little bit different. There's only one purpose for a single member. And that one purpose, I like to use my hand, so I have to put my clicker down here. That one purpose is that we need to prove to the court that you are not one and the same as your company. So now we're putting our single member LLC over here you, the individual owner, you're over here. The operating agreement is the first documentation that formally gives you that separation. It draws that line between the LLC and you. So now you have to look at the LLC as its own individual being, just like you are. It has its own name, its own birth date, the formation date. It has its own federal ID number, like you have your own social security number. So this is the way that we show that legal separation, that you are trying to run your business the way you're supposed to, and you're entering into a legally binding contract with yourself, essentially. But that is the only purpose, is the maintenance part. When we get into a multi-member, when you've got a business partner, and we're, we're gonna get there in a minute, it takes on not just the maintenance aspect, but now we're doing the prenup, right? How are we going to run this business? So we're all on the same page. So, Another part of the documentation are consent forms. You need to be documenting every single business decision that affects operations. So I'm not talking about when you go to Staples to buy copy paper. We don't need to be writing that down and signing it. I'm talking about, oh, we're gonna offer bonuses now. We're gonna enter into a lease agreement because we're moving. We're going to hire an attorney to create this contract. Those are things that could be documented, and it's simple. Don't, don't think of this as something that's hard and it's gonna take a lot of your time. I am doing what I do today because I wanna show you there are easy ways to do this so that you are ready if that one person does file that lawsuit. All of this documentation is gonna be brought out and you're gonna, it's gonna be used as evidence to support mm -hmm. your side, your version of the events, and that you've separated yourself you deserve that liability protection. So that means they can't come after your home or your bank account, okay? Any questions about this? All right, if you have business partners, sometimes we just wanna stick our, hand, our heads in the sand. <laughs> business partnership is a marriage. It is so like a marriage, and it can end in divorce. And that divorce can be ugly. I don't like ugly business divorces. I've been there. They're not fun. Or even family business breakups. It, 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 it's an ugly divorce as well. The way that we keep it from being ugly, and I'll give you just a couple of examples, is you start out with a, a good operating agreement. So if it's an LLC, if it's an S-Corp, you want a shareholder's agreement. So typically every S-Corp has bylaws. I find that over and over again. That's typical, but they don't have the shareholder's agreement. 
So now the operating and the shareholders agreement are doing the same thing. We're laying out how are certain business decisions going to be made? Who, ha who has uh, the legal authority to vote? What's gonna happen if one of us dies, one of us gets in a car accident, we can't run the business, we can't make those management decisions that we're supposed to be able to do? What if I want out in five years? What if five years happens and I'm like, you know what, this isn't working for me anymore. I want out. How are, how are we gonna work that out? So I always wanna take the preventative step. I wanna figure out now how things are gonna go because when the hiccup happens, we're kind of emotional. And this is the human factor. We don't make good decisions if we're under stress or if somebody is, if your business partner hasn't filed taxes for five years and now the IRS is coming after them personally and the assets of the business. We don't make good decisions under that kind of a stress and that happens. Operating agreements are going to help the business owners, I sometimes say force you to have those conversations that maybe you're not so comfortable having with a business partner. Because it is uncomfortable to talk about finances. It is uncomfortable to do a follow-up and say, did you file the taxes? Is there anything I need to know? But an operating agreement can help you create the environment where you're constantly in check with each other. And then you're writing it down because there are certain things that you're going to have to put in a consent form and sign. So if someone can't go rogue, we don't want a business partner going rogue and dissolving the company or selling their shares or their ownership interests without the approval of the entire business. That helps that. But at the end of the day, I just had a, comp a, business, a client come and say, we set up the operating agreement, there were three partners, and they signed the operating agreement, did nothing about it. And so one of them did go rogue. The other two were blocked out of the bank account. They had no idea what was going on financially with the company. You have to make the decision to actually act on what's put in those operating agreements or shareholders agreements. So if you have one, look at it. Make sure it accurately reflects your expectations as the business owner, that it accurately reflects how you are operating your business. Barbara. I was just going to say, um, the exit strategy in almost every operating agreement is, is literally missing in most of them. Yeah. Yes. And how, like you mean how things are going to be paid? Correct. Or if someone wants to leave, or if somebody yeah. dies, or anything, that it's missing entirely from the operating agreement. Yep. So there's a lot of things that you can take into consideration when putting these together. And it can, it just provides that sense of relief. So then we're avoiding the miscommunication, the no communication. See, I have business owners, this is the reality, who hate confrontation. They don't want to talk to each other. So they avoid each other at all costs. And so then that's what happened with the taxes. Taxes didn't get filed and they're both at, at risk. Um, or assumptions, as human beings, the human factor, I think we make way too many assumptions of each other. My advice, don't assume anything. You can't assume that that employee that you love and you think is awesome will never sue you. That is false. You cannot assume that that customer, that client, oh, they loved what you did. They will never sue you. You have to, unfortunately, today, you have to operate your business as if everyone you deal with could be that one person that wants to take legal action. I'm sorry I could bring this stuff up, but you know a lot of people with this assumption use the word trust, and I say we don't use trust in this environment. You know, you can use it somewhere else, but we do not use trust in an operating agreement. Exactly. We're trying to, it just helps to keep you on the same page. Now I get some people, and I'm going to apply my operating agreement example to every contract that you do for your company. So it's preventative measure. It's to say, we already know these are the options for hiccups, because that's what I do. I put out all the hiccups that you might face as, your, as a business owner. And we figure out how you're going to deal with those hiccups in the operating agreement. That's how you need to look at every single contract that you do. Because the, better, the more that you plan on how to deal with it, it shows if you're dealing with employees, um, your customers and independent contractors, how you already know that there's gonna be hiccups between us. 
but we've got it figured out in this contract how we're going to deal with it. That doesn't mean that you may not have considered a hiccup that happens and it's not taken care of in the contract, but the terms will help you to figure that stuff out a lot easier if you just based your contract on a verbal or a handshake, which we don't want to do anymore. All right, contracts. This is a thorn in my side with the internet and online. The internet is not an attorney, just so you all know, okay? It's a great place to start, but it is not an attorney. One size does not fit all. What do I mean by that? I mean that I, <laughs> I do contract reviews, and I have it on my website that you can order it. So then I don't actually talk to the person before, so I have no idea where the contract is coming from, and when they submit it, I have to take a deep breath because I already know. They downloaded it from a similar company or maybe a friend who does what they do gave it to them because they got it from somewhere, but they don't really know where that came from. One size does not fit all, okay? Your contracts are going to set you up to fail if you just take a free one. It's great that it's free today, but it's not gonna be free later if that one person decides to sue you. It's gonna cost a lot of money. So those terms aren't drafted specifically for your type of business or your expectations as the business owner. So like Lark and I, we're completely two different individuals. I have different expectations than she does. My client services agreement could have terms in there that are completely different than what she would put in there. And we may be in the same business. You have to tailor these terms to fit your flow. How you run your business it needs to reflect you and what you expect as the business owner. Okay, so don't DIY at the end of the day. All right. 30% of lawsuits, remember, come from misunderstandings, even if you have a contract, because sometimes those terms are written. You guys love the legalese in contracts? <laughs> love it? Do you understand it? No, I hate legalese. So um, a lot of courts around the country are starting to fine attorneys who draft their motions using legalese, run on sentences. You know, one sentence takes the whole page. So years ago, this was a lot of work, but we went through it and we completely took out all passive voice. Everything is written in active voice. We have no whereas, you don't see those recitals, whereas, blah, 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 whereas, blah, blah. We don't, you don't need to do that. I want you to have a contract. Every party who reads it should exactly know exactly what it's saying. You shouldn't have to hire an attorney to interpret the terms. And so when I do a contract for a client, I'm doing it because I want you to be able to explain it to your client or your employee what the terms are. You should know. It's your contract. You shouldn't have to call me and say, now what did this, how is this really going to play out in reality if we have an issue? So this, I'm, ta I'm talking about operating agreements too. These are contracts. All right. So these are the most common contracts that I find with small business. You may not need all of them depending on your type of business or you may need all of them. But these are the most common. Client service agreements are so important and they provide so much peace of mind and they show that you're a reputable company, that you've done this before. You know what the hiccups could be. You wanna avoid a disaster. So I had a, um, a cabinet maker who didn't have a good contract in place and the, cl the customers, weren't, they wouldn't pay the balance because they weren't happy with the, the fixes that the company did or whatever it was. Customer had made a ton of changes. None of those changes were documented, nothing. The best way to handle it, if I'm your customer, I make changes to stuff all the time. I'm a nightmare for a builder or a landscape person. I'm a nightmare because I'm constantly thinking of things I wanna do differently. And so you put it in your client service agreement. Hey, Dana. I'm building your website. You can make three changes with the pricing I give you. Three. Anything else, this is what it's going to cost you. And guess what? You're going to have to sign a work order change form and then pay it under the terms before I make those changes. If I know that in advance, I'm so happy because I already know I've made four changes. Now I'm going to owe my website developer some more money. And I'm fine with that because I knew ahead of time. There's not gonna be an issue. I'm not gonna be complaining about that. Same goes for all of these. So are there any questions with any 
of these types of contracts that you, that are burning inside of you. Because I'm happy to go down a road. I could talk all day about this stuff, so. so. The one thing that I hate to hear is when I talk to somebody and we're talking maybe about a contract or an agreement, and, and they say, I said, make sure you read this, it's important. And they say, well, it says this, but they told me it means this. And I'm like, oh, it means what it says. Yeah, so that is in the what we refer to as boilerplate. I hate that term, boilerplate terms. There are certain terms that should be in every single contract. But the problem is that, again, one size does not fit all. So that is a term that we put in at the end of, con at the end of every contract that says, you know what? Anything that we talked about before we signed is out of the picture. It is not, if it's not in this contract, it's not part of our deal. Contract services agreement, what are some problems that you've seen that people have gotten into you know, they didn't think it through, it was missing, I don't know. So we do them, we do them, but it's boilerplate and you're saying be careful and I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. So with a client service contract, think about what is the purpose? The purpose is to communicate how much are you expecting your customer or your client to pay? What are the terms of payment going to be? Do you take credit cards? Are you, uh, off, are, is the customer authorizing you? Maybe you're setting up a monthly subscription. Are you allowed to keep their credit card on file? Are you allowed to automatically charge that subscription fee? Or do you have to send them an invoice? Are you, um, th that's the, the terms of the, the relationship will alleviate a lot of issues. But it is more about the invoicing and the payment. We lay it all out. So you want to figure out, that's what I'm talking about. Well, so the scope of the work. The scope of the work. The scope of the work. What, but it's your flow, right? So again, if someone has this exact same business as you, they may not. I've got clients who still will not take credit cards. They, they want cash or check only. They want to hand write out. They want to, they take the contract and they fill out whatever they need to fill out and they sign it right there with their clients. Or I've got some that now we've got apps, right? So then we have to look at that and we have to be signed up on their app so I can see exactly how the app handles signatures. Is it checking a box and that's your agreement? Is it typing in a name and that's your agreement? Because the terms of your contract have to be accurate. They cannot conflict with how the app that you're using is setting up the signature. So do you recommend employment agreements in all cases, or are there some cases where you recommend that some employees should have an employment agreement and some are really I love your question. Employment agreements, that is, that is the best question of the day. You have two options. We work in an at-will state, which means that if you have less than 15, well, anybody, let me separate it out. Any employer, if you want to terminate the employment relationship at any time for any reason, you can do that. But the employee can too. So what I used to tell I, employees who would call me and say, I need to sue my employer. I was wrongfully terminated. When I would explain that, you know what? Here's how Outwill works. My favorite color is purple, but you wear green to work today. I can fire you for that reason alone, and there's nothing that you can do about it. Employees don't like to hear that, you guys. So in our environment in Utah, we are not like California. California is an easy target for me. If you have just one employee in California, then you have to follow the California special rules, just like Title VII. So it's in addition. So there's more protections in California beyond Title VII, not in Utah. So I just, I'm now just referring to Title VII because that's how we are in Utah. We don't have extra rules. So if, I, if an employee wants to sue you, you have to have, for under Title VII, you have to have at least 15 employees. So if you have less than 15, that does not mean that you can go and discriminate. So be careful, okay? There's other ways that employee can get after you with a lawsuit. It's harder for them, but they can. So the best way, there are two options. The best way is even if you just have five employees, so I recommend five and up, definitely put in an employee handbook. It's a basic one, right? So we have different variations of a handbook. It depends on how many employees you have because the number of employees will determine what triggers your obligations under the law. 
So 15, so up to 15, we don't have to put anything in there about FMLA or Title VII. When we hit 15 to 49, we've got to have Title VII now and ADA, age discrimination, that stuff. 50 plus, now we've got to help have information in there about FMLA, about health insurance. There's more obligations. Handbooks are only used in a court situation to enforce against you, the business owners. They are not there to protect you. But they do help you because they keep, just like a contract, they keep the employees on your page. When people know what's expected, then they follow it. They don't create misunderstandings. And you can use that handbook if you have an employee that comes to you with something and you're like, there's so much in the handbook, I don't, I don't remember how we're dealing with extended leave right now. Let's go to the handbook. It's your Bible. It's your, it's your constitution. You go to it to help you be a better business owner. But it is not used for you. It's used against you. So be careful how you word things, Barbara. Do the employment agreements need to be redone annually? And does the handbook need to be updated at any particular time? I would update a handbook. I recommend after you first put one in place, to update it at the end of the year. And I actually recommend this with any contract that you start using for the first time because once you use a contract, a handbook, there are going to be things that you didn't think about. And so you will, make, you will need to make changes so that it accurately reflects how you're running your business. So handbook after the first year, for sure. Then I would look at it every two to three years or if there's major changes in employment law. For sure you need to, and COVID, those are just additional policies. So we write handbooks to say this is not a contract. <laughs> we, are, as the employers, we can make changes to policies at any time. So we, we keep it open for you. So you add in other policies. There are ways to do things in writing to document. And that's a whole other conversation for a different day. Can the handbook be um, on a website? Can it have like, sections on a website yeah. and then that's, the, that's where it all resides? And I and I love I love that's part of being tailored to you and your type of business and your expectations as the business owner. So it's great to be let it reflect you. I've got one I'm reviewing right now and they put some funny, funny memes in their handbook and it was awesome. I I, I was cracking up the whole time I was reading it. So it provided amusement for me. Printed little handbook and you signed the last page and ripped it. <laughs> yeah, you can do whatever you want. But I do want to answer your question, because I know I took a long way to get here, but there's a reason. If you have key employees who have access to your intellectual property, they have access to your financials, any trade secret access, anything that you want to protect and you want to be able to enforce, you need to have an employment agreement. So the most common thing is Employers are scared that their employees are going to leave and take their clients. I'm not even talking about non-compete. I think non-compete is, we, you can do it. It's in Utah, it's only, you can only restrict an employee for one year. I think it's gonna be gone soon. You won't even have non-compete. And honestly, it does not provide you any value. It's the non-solicitation that provides the most value. And so if you are afraid of that, you put it in a contract with each employee that you're concerned about, and it puts in some protections that they know if they steal your clients, they're gonna have to pay this amount of money. And you figure out what that reasonable amount is now because the court wants you to. They will like you better if you can figure it out today. So there's different ways. It may make sense to say, you know what, I have dentists that say 300 bucks for every patient you steal. Or maybe it's a formula. If some CPAs that say, um, you know, they take a certain percentage times this times this equals this, and we put that in the the term. Whatever works for you. And so these should the employment agreement should be updated every year. No, no, no. You do not need to update an employment agreement. Okay. Yeah, I had a question about that because if you have an employee that hires under one situation and now they're in a like they maybe they are more involved in finances or they do have then you need to put one in place and, and then so you just say we'd like you to re-sign an employee agreement for your new role or something like that. yeah so every contract will have a, a term in there to amend it to amend means to make changes 
And so if there are changes to the, the terms of our relationship between the parties and the contract, you do need to amend it. So I've, I have a client right now who started out with a PEO, and that PEO made every employee of my client sign a contract with the PEO. And this is going back, I have a contract from 2006. Now my client want, is afraid because that employee still works for him and he's gonna take some of the clients away. And so now we wanna address it by putting in a new contract. But I have to reflect the old contract accurately in order to make sure it replaces the old terms. So we don't run into any conflicts with those old terms. Okay, I have to cruise through the rest of this. We're taking lots of, I'm, I'm taking lots of time because I tend to go down long roads. But HR, I can't say enough about this. How, how being on the litigation side of HR, employees hate it just as much as the business owner. They don't want to sue you, you guys, they don't. And if you set up, if you have employment agreements, if you have a handbook, you actually train, that helps you to stay out of those lawsuits. So there are aspects of HR though, hiring, onboarding, training, evaluating performance, and offboarding. The one thing that will keep you out of a lawsuit and will also, and I can guarantee this, will keep the harmony in your company, and this is a lot of work to do initially, but once you do it, and then you have to keep updating as things change, but once you do then the initial work, it helps so much, is consistency with the terms. So let's say you're hiring. You've got to come up with your step-by-step. -step. So I'll tell you my step-by-step. -step. I, I create a job description for a legal assistant. I use that job description to now put an ad out. When someone applies, I'm going to send them a link to a questionnaire that they have to fill out. And then at the end of the questionnaire, ask them to submit a video to me. And this is something new I tried last time. It worked great, by the way. But we all have our own system. So you gotta set up your, your system. Then I did telephone interviews. And then if I liked what I saw in that, then I invited them for an interview with me. And then we did a working interview. Whatever your step-by-step -step is, get that in writing. And every single applicant is required to go through the same system. It doesn't matter if it's the front office to your bookkeeper. That consistency, so, not, so you're not treating somebody differently because they're a family friend. So my daughter ha is now working for me. She's like, I have to fill out an application? Yeah, you do, because guess what? If I get sued, I want to be able to show that I treated you just like I treated everybody else. That's where I'm coming from. So. App, job applications are really important, but be careful with those. There are certain things in those applications that you want to make sure are right. So you need to talk to an attorney before you do that. All right. Again, <laughs> I hated the office, you guys. This came out when I was litigating. I couldn't watch it. My kids are older, and they started bringing me into the room to watch it, and now I kind of think it's hilarious because it's the extreme, right? Michael is the extreme, but he constantly bags on HR. If you know who Toby McGuire, or Toby, yeah, Flenderson. Flenderson. He bags on Toby. Toby's his nemesis, right? Because he hates all the stuff HR. HR gets a bad rap. And unfortunately, if you're the only business owner, you're, you hold that HR hat along with everything else. All right, this is what I'm going to end on, civility. So civility is like... Um, This is the human factor. And I think that um, we forget about it. We forget that we're coming to work and we don't need to be best friends. You don't need to be best friends with your employees. You really don't. Because you're gonna have people working for you that you don't get along with and you don't really like them. But guess what, they do a good job for you. They perform. They get along with others in the office. In Utah, I can, I can pick on University of Utah versus BYU. You know, I went to the U, my husband went to BYU. <laughs> um, at home, I can jar him with that as much as I want. I can prance around in my Utah gear as much as I want when BYU's playing. But at work, I'm respectful. That's the difference. So with anything, it starts at the top and it flows down. So that's why I'm bringing it to you guys, because as business owners, what, what does civil mean? So civil can mean 
are you actually responding when a customer puts up a little bit of a, a jar on the Google reviews about you? How are you handling it? Are you ignoring them? Or are you actually being civil and responding, taking ownership, and maybe trying to do better? Are you setting that example for your employees that you are acknowledging stuff? We all make mistakes. But response, are you ignoring your employees who send you an email that they want to talk to you? Or maybe you do the meeting with the employee and you hear their complaints about whatever the issues are. And you say, OK, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. You get so busy, you don't get back to them. These are the things that boil in that pot that's on the stove boiling and turn into lawsuits. So all of us attorneys, we have different opinions on things. And you may hear another attorney say something completely different. But from my past experience litigating against companies for sexual harassment, discrimination stuff, I can guarantee you that if we can create civility, we're going to avoid landing in that type of a lawsuit. Those are the things that turn into the legal disasters that cost you so much money. All right, appreciation. This is my newest thing. And I, I tend to give you my newest thing. So this is what I'm on right now. The guy who wrote The Five Languages of Love, he's got five languages of appreciation in the workplace. This is awesome. In fact, a CPA is the one who showed it to me. And I, I just love it because it goes right along with civility. So I encourage you to check it out. All right, make kindness the norm. I'm going back to lens. It's your choice as the business owner what you do tomorrow. Think of one thing. We've talked about that one thing you can do to change for your health, your leadership. Think of one thing that you can do better tomorrow to make sure that you are able to say, you know what, bring it on. You want to sue me? Bring it on. All right, there you go.